Any of you? No. How many of you were born or brought up in the West? A fair few of you, okay. Well, anybody born in the Arab world or any other world that went to live in the West? So, okay, a bit like me then. I was born in Pakistan and uh, I ended up in Britain and from my village I very quickly became a Paki in England and I didn't really understand what a Paki was in those days. I very quickly learned, however, what it was. You became colored, you became a wog, you became all sorts of other, other things within Britain. And my African friends were like that as well. They didn't know they were black until they got to Britain. And we used to find this very, very difficult. Sometimes we tried to hide in, in whiteness, which we couldn't get. And where does Malcolm X fit into all this? So I'm not going to give you a speech of what he represented. You've heard some very eloquent uh, uh, positions already. For us, it became a very nasty struggle to survive in a society in which you had gangs of paki bashers, in which you had young white boys who would rub their fingers on your skin to see if the dirt came off. In a sense, you got to hate each other, but I came to England two years after Malcolm X's death, and all these things started happening many, many years later. What racism did to people like myself was it opened a door that there's something fundamentally wrong in the world in which we live. But what Malcolm X did was gave us a key to understand that there's something far, far bigger beyond that door, in that darkness, beyond the darkness. We can negate the world in which we live. And actually, for me, he was a teacher, he was a comedian, he was a storyteller, he was all sorts of different things. So in a sense, are we all in now, please? Can we shut the door, Habibi? You know? Shut the door now, please. Okay. So we won't, without much further ado, we are going to welcome Malcolm X. And we have a surprise for you as well, which Malcolm will tell you now. If some of you are inclined to agree with him, you can tell him Malcolm is capable of handling it. If some of you disagree, like our last uh, private performance, you can still tell him that you disagree. He's happy to have it. But whatever way, enjoy what he has to say. And Malcolm is not going to give you any great historical things, but he's going to talk to you about what's going on in the world of today and why he's come. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him after 50 years to the same institution which wouldn't let him come. You're all smiling now. You might stop when you see him. Malcolm. This feels so good to be back. I can tell by the looks on your faces you're puzzled. Some of you are saying, uh, isn't Malcolm X dead? <laughs> this is just a drama. Malcolm X is dead. Is he? Why has he come here now after 50 years? And what on earth is he doing here, if you excuse the pun? Well, I'm going to tell you who really killed me. What mischief is happening in America and what havoc America is wreaking all around the world. Bless you. <laughs> you know, before I came here, on my way to this very place, I saw a man who... Uh, uh, a small, round Lebanese man, you know, your, your normal, normal Lebanese man. And I got lost on the way, so I took out the address. This is not the address. And I said, Salamu Alaikum, brother. Would you perhaps know where this place is? And the look of astonishment came over him. I didn't know what I'd said that would cause about this. Uh, truly couldn't be the salam. Must be only when I called him brother. A black man calling him brother must have been very problematic for him. He looked me up and down, touched my jacket, even my tie. And he said, Suyak Ruth, how much are they paying you these days? I didn't have time to answer this. And I showed him the address again. 
He took it and he said, yes, 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 it's not far from here. But first tell me, Habibi, do you have a sister? My maid ran away last week. I need a new maid. My wife, she's going crazy. It's very urgent. What do you say? This is not the way I was, on. I was, I was greeted last time I came to Beirut. Back in April 1964. Then I was greeted by African students, by Lebanese and Palestinians. I was meant to speak here at the American University of Beirut, but uh, they wouldn't let me. And I think there's someone here in the audience that was there. Oh, is that you, Peter? Peter was there 51 years ago. Peter, my friend. 51 years, Peter. You haven't changed a bit. Uh, well, you see, Peter, in heaven, we grow younger. The president of the AUB would not let me speak. He said the AUB was an American ground and I was anti-American. <laughs> me, anti-American. I guess it depends which America you're talking about. You know, some say I was killed by the Nation of Islam. Some say it was the FBI or the CIA who had really done it. I even ha heard a theory that a group of Arabs done it. Would you believe it in the Arabs done it theory? There was three of them. Two were Algerians from the suburbs of Paris. And one was a well-known man from Saudi Arabia whose son would go on to become America's most wanted terrorist. America's most wanted Allahu Akbar. On February 21st, 1965, they put 21 bullets into me. I saw the people who shot me stand up, take out their guns, and point them towards me. I saw the bullets coming. I heard Betty screaming, and let me tell you now that the screams of the woman I loved was far more painful than the bullets that entered my chest. Brothers and sisters, friends and enemies, I'm happy to see you all here in one place. I hadn't planned to talk about France, but shortly after I came, there was a man who recognized me right away. He ran to me with a placard in his hand. I think I got it for you. He ran to me with this placard in his hand, which read, uh, Je suis Charlie. He came running to me, he said, Brother Malcolm, have you heard, brother? I said, heard what? He said, what happened in France? It's war, brother, it's happening, it's war. I told him, brother, you worry too much about the master's house. Look at you, look where you're standing right now. Look at Libya, Iraq, Palestine, look at Syria. That is war, brother. You're already surrounded in war, brother. See, let me make one thing perfectly clear. <laughs> Charlie Hebdo, they were peddlers of hate and racism, but they should not have been killed. But all those people who went around saying, Je suis Charlie, they are part of packs of racist wolves or of ignorant sheep who the wolves one day will come and eat. Because in the West, can you really separate Islamophobia from racism? Imagine Germans of the time of the Nazis or today trying to separate anti-Semitism from racism. How can you stretch freedom of speech to do that? 
And what about this German writer called uh, Julius Streaker? He was a German writer before uh, the Nazis seized power, and uh, uh, he wrote anti-Semitic, racist children's books, and then went on to work for the Nazis. But when they were defeated, he was tried, and he was executed. Not for killing anyone, this man never pulled the trigger, but for spreading racism, for creating the climate for the enactment of crimes against humanity. But they can do that to Muslims today, can they not? Even Muslim lookalikes like that unarmed Brazilian man. His name was Jean Charles de Menezes, and he was shot dead in Britain because they said he looked like a Muslim. Islamophobia can never be separated from racism in the West. It is the very oxygen of racism, of hate, and it was never far away from France's surface or from France's history, not according to 1.5 million Algerians slaughtered by France, not according to the Algerians still today living under France's boots. Je ne suis pas Charlie, I am no Charlie. And what a time to come back. A time when black people in America are being gunned down once again, like they were in the 1960s and before that. Gunned down by police carrying a kill black man and don't go to jail card. Well, let me say this to the police and their masters. You don't scare us today with no badge or no white skin or no white sheet or no white anything else. The police, they're doing the same old dog tricks today that they were doing 50 years ago and before that. They put their club upside your head and then they turn around and accuse you of attacking them. Every single case of police brutality against us it follows the same pattern. They attack you, they bust you all up and then they drag you to court and they charge you with assault. And they say America is a democracy. They have all sorts of uh, pretty words to describe themselves. Uh, democracy. At least they got the last part right, the crazy part right. All they need now is a big white hippo at the beginning of the word. Only then would it make sense. For what kind of democracy is that? What kind of freedom is that? What kind of social or political system is it when a black man has no voice in court? Other than that of Uncle Tom, of course. Has no nothing on his side other than what the white man chooses to give you, which is nothing at all. We have to put a stop to this. I've been watching what happened in Ferguson. Watching how Michael Brown, with his hands up, watching how they killed him and then criminalized him. Watching Eric Garner, who begged them, I can't breathe, he said. And they killed him too. I heard what their grand jury had to say, sat right there in the room when they said it. I heard the racist songs the police sang after Michael Brown has gone down. And yes, when you hear all those voices that hate you, you should be angry, very angry. But all you angry people demonstrating angry at how Michael Brown with his hands up is shot, then why or oh why are all you good people going around with your hands up screaming, hands up, don't shoot? Wake up, people. Haven't you learned the basic lesson yet? You raise your hands to the air, they don't care, they'll shoot you. They'll shoot you dead and go home to a nice home-cooked meal. They'll shoot you wherever your hands are. And then they'll criminalize you after your death. 
with their armored cars, body armor, armored cars and tanks and guns, they'll say they were just defending themselves. <laughs> they say they feared for their lives. This black man was so strong, strong like a beast, an animal.